Herzlich willkommen zum Künstlergespräch mit Marwa Asanios, hier zu meiner Rechten sitzen. Es ist toll, dass so viele Leute gekommen sind und dass so ein großes Interesse an der Ausstellung und an der Künstlerin besteht. Zu meiner Linken sitzt Mechte Schwingmann, die die Ausstellung kuratiert hat, zusammen mit mir, Sören Krane. Und ähm, ja, wir steigen gleich ein in die und beginnen mit der ersten Frage. Hallo. Um, when I try to, uh, uh, <laughs> when I try to define ecofeminism, I prefer to do it by highlighting its opposite, uh, white feminism. Uh, I want to ask you, how do you define ecofeminism? I think it's not an opposite to white feminism because um, a lot of ecofeminists, especially in the 70s when you know, there was a um, kind of focus on anti-nuclear, um, yeah, like uh, resistance. Yeah, so, so if we want to go back to like a, a kind of a history of where uh, ecological or eco-feminist, uh, you know, were started or were born from a context of uh, anti-nuclear resistance. Um, and this is obviously what's happening in uh, a Western or so-called like Western context because this is where, um, yeah, like the kind of a, uh, um, that, that kind of uh, fight was uh, taking place. Um, and um, also like against the militarization, against a, uh, um, uh, for example, in the UK there was like a very strong movement um, against a um, uh, yeah like Amer American or like US military bases uh, um, in, uh, in in certain um, areas in uh, the especially in um, close to Scotland. So um, so I think that. If you want to think about uh, ecofeminism as in like a um, um, oppo an opposite to white feminism, I think ecofeminism is born of a certain kind of uh, ecological uh, movement uh, that try to bring together uh, feminist uh, politics and uh, ecological movements. Uh, not necessarily an opposition to uh, so-called white fem feminism or what Françoise Vergès, for example, calls, you know, like a middle-class white, uh, privileged white feminism. Uh, so it is born in, of course, like a, um, uh, a leftist uh, uh, circles or out of leftist politics, but also uh, in relation to a, um, an understanding of patriarchy that is actually uh, repressing and oppressing women as much as it is uh, uh, oppressing and exploiting and trying to control nature. So it's also born uh, out of a understanding of patriarchy that is wider to a, uh, uh, you know, like a, a kind of a domestication of, of, of women or like a uh, a, um, you know, like a kind of a structure of violence that is oppressing a, uh, a women or a, a female um, bodies. Uh, but also, uh, at the same time, it is a, um, yeah, like a, a, a wider uh, oppression that uh, also touches upon nature and the oppression of nature. So uh, I think ecofeminists had the understanding that you know, like a, the oppression of women is very much connected to the oppression of, of nature, the exploitation of nature, and the you know, kind of a uh, in the same manner that women's, uh, for example, or like female bodies uh, were um, uh, or like needed uh, to be controlled by. A patriarchal uh, kind of a regime, let's call it like that, uh, the nature was also treated similarly. So it really comes from that uh, moment where these two, the intersection of ecology and the way, you know, like it is violently uh, uh, exploited by a capitalist patriarchal system 
uh, is also uh, connected to an exploitation of you know uh, uh, women and female female bodies. Um, I think what is interesting and what was interesting for us to revisit, uh, uh, you know, like notions and uh, theories and texts by ecofeminists and uh, around questions of the intersection of ecology and feminism was also to uh, try to uh, think of a possibility of a, uh, an, um, yeah, like an ecological feminist that is directly linked to decolonial struggles or anti-colonial struggles. And I think in that sense, uh, we can make the bridge, I mean, this is something that uh, a lot of, for example, the um, you know, writers from the uh, Kurdish Autonomous Women's Movement are doing. Uh, a lot of, of course, like a, uh, uh, you know, a women uh, from uh, indig indigenous communities in uh, different parts of South America are already doing. Uh, so they are kind of like making this bridge to link questions of uh, so-called ecofeminism and, and understanding that comes from uh, that uh, you know oppression of uh, female bodies and oppression of so-called nature between quotation marks is uh, something that runs in, in, in uh, together or that these oppressions are connected. Um, and I think that they were also uh, what like we can see in the Kurdish autonomous women's movement is also, for example, a kind of a, uh, a decolonial approach to that, uh, uh, and a decolonial approach to uh, the to the resistance and the means of resistance. Uh, so the means of resistance are, uh, you know, like decolonial in themselves, right? Um, and we can talk more about that if you like. But I think that maybe this is the. And of course, like I think ecofeminism is interesting uh, in today also because you know um, there has been a um, an attempt by uh, kind of neoliberal economies and uh, you know like a, uh, a sort of like neoliberal um, um, yeah like a, a hegemony of the nineties. There has been an attempt and a very like a, a systematic attempt to uh, divide struggles, right? So, for example, the feminist struggle was, you know, uh, turned into women's rights only, and then separated from, um, uh, you know, ecological struggles. Or, uh, and I think what is interesting about uh, ecofeminism, what could be interesting about revisiting ecofeminist. Uh, 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 tradition and thought today is the uh, you know like a um, desire to that they had to link these struggles right to say that uh, you know feminist uh, uh, struggles are not separated from you know ecological struggles therefore are not separated from racial struggles they are not separated from class struggles etc and I think in that sense maybe it is. Uh, uh, yeah, like interesting to bring back the ecofeminist discussion um, while thinking about it from a decolonial perspective, like all these different women, uh, women, sorry, are doing. Yeah. Martha, you are you are also doing a PhD in artistic research at the Academy of uh, Fine Arts in Vienna, right? Uh, could you please tell us uh, how do you implement methods of artistic research yeah. into your practice and why is that still necessary or important for you also to deepen it through a PhD yeah. when you also have this quite activist approach in your work? Yeah, I think that uh, there's still like this discussion about what is artistic research. Um, yeah, until, un until like, it's something that we ask ourselves in the PhD, you know, often. So what are we actually doing? Especially that, for example, if I'm talking about artistic research from this uh, institutional perspective, because of course there is like in the, through the PhD, a kind of an institutionalization of artistic research. Uh, and if we go back a little bit, I mean, 
there is also another strand or like another like a kind of a, uh, a strand of thought that um, yeah claims that well there is no no such thing as artistic research research is or it's not something specific you know it's not something that is uh, needs to be like to become a yeah uh, a major at the university or something that you study because anyway there is an every artistic practice is research in itself whether it is you know painting whether it is you know sculpture whether, whether it is like a dealing with film etc so the, the this is inherent anyway to any kind of artistic practice so everyone is researching so the the uh, idea that artistic research becomes this like very specific, special thing that then can be like packaged into a major at the university is also that has a lot of resistance as well. So I'm, I'm more thinking about, you know, like from the PhD that we are doing. And, uh, um, but I think that I, yeah, I mean, maybe I, I never, I, I wasn't like calling what I do, I wasn't calling it always, you know, like a artistic research or, I knew that I was always interested in research and that this was a kind of a, of a drive, you know, uh, but I wasn't interested in academic research. I was never really like a, uh, um, pursuing a kind of a uh, research in, a, in this kind of like an academic way. What was more um, interesting for me, and this is something that, you know, I, um, I did a lot, I practiced a lot through the structure uh, that uh, uh, I built together with uh, two other people in, uh, in Lebanon, and it was called the 98 Weeks Research Project. Um, and this was like in, back in 2007. It started. It, it ran for like for 10 years, um, and I think that that was like a really formative moment uh, for building an understanding of what research is in, in the arts. Um, and um, yeah, and in fact, I was like uh, really seeking to open up a question but then that the research itself becomes a communal thing so research is not done by you know like one person uh, just like a uh, you know driven by a scholarly desire or uh, even a kind of a, uh, a, a a solitary artistic desire but that the research becomes in itself a kind of a uh, collective endeavor. So uh, through 98 Weeks Research Project, this is what I learned mostly. These kind of like collective ways of doing research. Uh, also like collective ways of working and learning. So there was always a kind of a yeah, peer to peer learning methodologies if we can, you know, think about um, if you want to think about methodologies of research or um, and, and I think that that was a really formative moment in order to build this ground for what collective research could be and what it can, you know, how it can actually um, like a open um, and challenge questions of authorship, of course, and research. Also, like, challenge questions of working together and challenge also questions of pedagogy and learning as well. Um, so through research or through research question or research material, and I can give some examples, uh, what we were doing is actually uh, setting up a, a way of um, you know, learning together that would be um, yeah, like self-organized. It was mostly like artists that were you know self-organizing. Uh, we were calling for a you know whoever was had an interest in the, the specific topic to join us, uh, and we were also like uh, developing methodologies that are actually 
adequate for that specific research or for that moment or for the means that we had. Um, and, and all of that became public and the ways of doing research became public. So it was a really a very, let's say, transparent or like open process. And I think opening these processes of research was like the, the interesting, uh, yeah, like the, 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 the thing that drove the, the, the research itself. Um, so I think like a lot of my ways of working uh, come from that uh, experiment that we had at 98 Weeks Research um, and also ways of setting up structures. Uh, and in that sense, I think that I'm, that's also like one of my main drives. I'm really interested in setting up structures and how to actually build structures and infrastructures. And in a way, I still feel like in the back of my head that maybe this is uh, the most interesting thing for me. You know, that this is really like what actually drives everything. Uh, setting up structures that could then uh, invite or like a carve a space for uh, people to come in, but also for uh, necessary questions, whether you know, uh, in relation to uh, you know aesthetics and politics, in relation to questions of uh, yeah, I don't know, like a uh, um, specific uh, discussions or like a very specific historical research in, in relation to a rewriting of history, etc. Um, I think the, this space or these containers or this research space would become like the um, yeah like the, the, the kind of a uh, um, yeah like the the, the, the the thing that allows or the thing that permits the research to happen and and yeah I think that a lot of my research methodologies they come from there from this like you know working with other people. Uh, setting up a space for research, trying to uh, yeah, like redefine methodologies, trying to uh, adapt, hack, also like hack certain existing me uh, research methodologies, uh, using forms that are, you know, looks like uh, a little bit, I don't know, uh, boring and old documentary forms, like interview forms, or but trying to use them in a way that could. Uh, yeah, like we open the discussion on the forum itself as well. So yeah, so I think that it um, comes from that way of working um, that is really concerned with, yeah, like as I said, carving space, building structure, and opening the conversation and uh, finding ways to work together. Yeah, you also explained the function of reading learn by explaining your artistic research, and I hope we will have uh, very many vivid uh, discussions together in the reading room, different than the famous uh, libraries of Heidelberg, where everyone reads uh, individually. And um, as far as I know, Matter of Alliance is also the title of your um, thesis. And can you explain the title of the exhibition? And also, many people were asking yesterday who's afraid of ideology. So. Um, yeah, so uh, Matter of Alliances is coming from maybe like a wordplay that would be um, connected to questions of matter, matter as in like material matter, like earth, soil, uh, for example, um, that uh, reference to matter that is like a, uh, considered as like the non-human, the non-human matter. Uh, and the question of the matter of, of alliances is, um, yeah, is a question of an alliance with um, yeah, between that, who is that non-human matter, or how this non-human matter is also again, uh, you know, part of a certain struggle, especially when we are talking and thinking about struggles, um, a struggle of, uh, you know, land struggles, 
uh, there, I guess, like the matter or like yeah, the non-human matter becomes an uh, inherent part of, of, of that struggle and the necessary one. Um, so yeah, so I think that um, yeah, maybe matter of alliance comes from you know the, like literally this alliance with matter. Um, but yeah, then again, um, how can this alliance happen? Is also uh, the question, and it is happening uh, with like the different uh, you know cooperatives and communes that are um, that I have been uh, involved with, uh, and I um, I think that this is being practiced this kind of an alliance with in the non-human matter, um, and also. Um, yeah, if you, you were asking about the, the title, Who is Afraid of Ideology? Yeah, I think it, it's a, um, it, it is a, a direct response to um, that moment and it's very specific. Um, yeah, that, then you can call it white corporate feminism. Uh, a, a kind of a response to that where you know, like maybe this is also again we can uh, go back to the 90s, where um, a kind of a, a moment of a belief that ideology was was over since you know like the Soviet bloc uh, um, collapsed and then um, was it I, was it uh, the ideology as well collapsed, right? Um, and we were like uh, entering this uh, open, uh, free, free world, right? So we were uh, entering like a moment of a um, uh, ultimate uh, freedom uh, uh, in this like one, one uh, world that was not uh, polarized or uh, divided anymore. And uh, and I think that a lot of uh, feminist. Um, um, yeah, like movements, not, not even movements, like feminist, uh, let's say, uh, thoughts and uh, ideology, um, a, like a kind of feminism that we can call, you know, like a uh, white corporate feminism, as I said, uh, what, believe that it's, you know, we are also like beyond a, uh, a, a kind of like an ideology or like a beyond also even beyond a uh, feminist struggle in that sense, because there is a kind of an equality that has been achieved through the workspace, through like a corporation, corporations basically. Um, and going back to the autonomous women's movement um, and, you know, like a, a clear, um, a kind of a clear uh, articulation of ideology, of their own ideology in their work, in the practice, in the uh, political writing, etc. Uh, I think that this has, um, yeah, it, it's a, it has been very provocative for many uh, feminist movements, this kind of uh, ideology or like a, this clear articulation of ideology. And yeah, I think that the title is a provocation, I guess. It's a provocation to this uh, specific uh, 90s feminism. I mean, I call it very like, you know, generally like this, uh, this kind of like a 90s uh, feminism. I think it's a, it's, it's a provocation. Uh, it's a provocation, but it's also like a, a way for um, a lot of people from my generation with whom I was having discussion to um, also like a um, uh, people who, who grew up with this belief of you know that uh, uh, feminism has, is is not needed anymore. Uh, it's a way for um, yeah for us to um, yeah rethink um, all of that and you know get rid of the, these. Uh, liberal hegemonic feminism, right? So I think that this was also like a provocation to liberal hegemonic feminism. Yes. Um, to what extent and on what level maybe do you see your work as a some sort of contribution to that discourse if the subaltern can speak? Yeah. And do you still accept that category at all? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, yeah, a, pro a provocative question because um, I think that the very category of uh, the subaltern coming from you know someone that is uh, not uh, or like coming from a kind of like an educated uh, educated position. Um, I think there is already like a, a kind of a class problem there in the in the question itself. And by asking that, by asking this question, you are already like a. Yeah, um, I mean, I like the, the text a lot, so that's you know, the, I I like Spivak's text, so it's not like a yeah, uh, a, a critique. I'm I'm just thinking about like a yeah, um, the when was this text written? I don't know, like a. So like it's three decades, three de decades ago, yeah. right? Three decades ago. So um, I think that to think about it today, um, from the perspective of um, like a, um, a, I think that it's it's a very complicated uh, um, question because also to think about it today from a perspective of. Uh, understanding of the uh, complexity of struggle and also like the complexity of the different uh, intertwinement of, of struggle, I think this is when um, it becomes difficult to, to respond to that. Um, because in fact by asking this question, we understand today that by asking this question we are already creating a category. The category of the subaltern, right? So we are already like placing a certain group of people uh, in this uh, a position of subalternity, whereas the subaltern is speaking already without you asking this question or not. It doesn't matter anymore if you ask this question or not. Um, and maybe Spivak also came to this. Uh, text also from the context, from the uh, Indian context uh, of uh, the um, uh, 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 yeah, like the uh, intersection or like intertwinement of class and caste, right? So um, and it was also like thinking about the Dalit class as well. So it's very localized in, in that context. But if you, if I want to like think about it from the perspective of um, yeah, like a, take it out of this context and try to think about it in relation to uh, uh, yeah, like my work, for example, or what I am doing. Uh, I think that um, it's actually what happens in the process of my work is that there is a learning process that I am going through by. Uh, you know, like joining, uh, uh, yeah, like a um, communities that are living at, or like communes and cooperatives that are living um, in a yeah, situation that is quite on the edge um, and conflictual, let's say, situation. Um, and from there, there is like a, a listening process. So I'm not asking the question of if one can speak or not, because I am in the position of listening, because I know already that the other, the other is speaking as well, right? And I think that there is something quite nice that uh, yeah, Karen Barat talks about, and it's uh, the question of the void. Um, when she's, of course, she's coming from quantum physics, but what is interesting about this approach to, to the void is that uh, the void uh, uh, itself, or like what I'm paraphrasing now, so the void itself, or what she's saying about the void, the, there is no emptiness, there is no empty space, there is no like a yeah, uh, vacuum actually, because it's um, if you like try to listen closely, you will hear the murmuring 
it's not loud, but it's murmuring. And you will hear the, the murmuring if you try to listen closely. So I think that the question of, uh, and that's coming from a quantum physician, and I would not be able to explain it in that way. I'm explaining it in a much more, uh, you know, like a simple way. Um, and so I think that uh, already, like when you are positioning, when you are um, uh, like a, a forming or like constructing a category of the subaltern, you are creating this other, and you are creating an other that you would assume does not speak. And in fact, um, it's already like a, a problematic position, right? You are already like making this uh, divide and uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know uh, if I if I answered. Uh, I, I, we can talk more. Yeah, about. I will. Uh, uh, if, um, I will say also something about Spivak. Um, in her text, I think she's criticizing the uh, practices of uh, European intellectuals like Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze because they were experimenting with uh, other class people. They were inviting uh, workers to their classes and or like prisoners and they were acting like now we are silent and these people are talking. And uh, she was criticizing this action of making your subject position transparent, like invisible. So in that sense, I think she's not trying to uh, define an, uh, the other, but the invisible uh, Western subject in this experiment. So in this context, my question is about uh, your position in your films, because you reflect a lot how to uh, find uh, ethical forms of storytelling and sometimes you're also placing yourself at like at the beginning of who's afraid of ideology part one and your voice is very present in the film so i want to ask the function of it yeah yeah i think that i um yeah very like i uh, clearly needed to uh, uh, situate or like articulate my own position in relation to uh, the different um, movements I was uh, so-called embedded in, and uh, um, it, I think it was important to articulate this uh, position also by, um, you know, like a um, clearly stating that um, I am the, the, the mediator in this, I am almost like uh, someone who is transmitting the. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, transmitting the story, right, and transmitting the knowledge. And I'm like, yeah, almost like a, a, a facilitator or a mediator of that, um, and articulating that uh, separation of, you know, my position in relation to the movement itself, or like, um, yeah, articulating my position in relation to the movement. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I had a lot to drink last night. <laughs> <laughs> I told you not to party hard. <laughs>
And, and if yes, if so, uh, against the backdrop of some of the films shown in this exhibition or one of the films, could you also give an example of how you do that mm -hmm. artistically or as a filmmaker in your work? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, I think that this is, a, um, the work is almost like a different ways of approaching documentary filmmaking. Uh, in a very like expanded sense, so uh, it's scripted and it's often like there's maybe like some also fictional elements and um, in some cases it is not. But uh, I think that um, it's uh, like <clears throat> it's almost like a uh, thinking through an expansion of what documentary could could be and could still do as a um, filmic and as well as a political practice. So I think that it's also like testing the, the kind of a limits and uh, capacities, let's say, or like a, uh, um, yeah, like uh, the, the, the medium itself um, and the language itself. And it's always trying to stretch it while using, you know, certain maybe sometimes very conventional documentary tropes uh, and other times, you know, getting away from that completely. Um, but I think that in, in different cases it has played a, uh, it has taken a different form. And I think it's really the context and the encounter that uh, give the form. Um, so for example, in Who's Afraid of Ideology Part 2, uh, because when I was in Ginoir, it was like a, a moment where you know the village was itself starting, and it was like the beginning of the you know building this uh, this village, and uh, people were uh, you know moving, uh, like starting to move to the houses, etc. So um, at the same time, I really felt the precarity, the precarity of the situation and also felt the possibility of, you know, that situation and that experiment not being, uh, not being able to continue, maybe. So, um, in that sense, I think it became almost like it imposed, the language imposed itself, and it became almost like a document, right? Like a, a documentation of that experiment. And I felt like this urgency imposed the form, for example. Um, and I think that in other cases, like in, for example, part four, there, there is much more, it's more, it's more scripted uh, in that sense, but it's also like a, uh, uh, there is like another time, another temporality to the project itself. Therefore, the form became, you know, much more uh, scripted, dialogical, etc. But it's really about the temporality and the urgency of the situation uh, itself and what this uh, can actually shape and how this can shape the form and the aesthetics and uh, you know like the, the language of, of the documentary um, and I think that uh, yeah I mean the, the format itself for example even in part two we can say it's a more conventional uh, let's say documentary uh, but the format or like the, 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 the kind of a, yeah, the device itself is challenged. Like the interview device is challenged. The way, you know, like a, uh, um, yeah, like the editing is challenging the form, etc. The apparatus is always, always there. There's like a self-reflective process as well. So, um, so yeah, so I think that in every uh, situation or in every like a, a encounter, um, there is a, a you know the, the encounter also like is uh, giving birth to or like a producing the the, 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 the form uh, itself. Um, and yeah, but I could I, I would say that it is a kind of a thinking through the documentary format and what this can do is it useful? Can it still be uh, you know uh, politically useful, viable? Can it still do something? Uh, is it uh, you know like with in, in, in a moment where 
platform capitalism or kind of social media is the main, uh, you know, like a yeah, space for activism, like a, a kind of a sharing and resharing of uh, posts. That's a way of, you know. Uh, Excuse me to interrupt. Do you think it can? Um, I think what it can do is almost like build another structure and through, you know, film becomes a kind of this mobile structure that carves again a space and builds a kind of a, yeah, opens a space for, um, for, for the for the question to to emerge uh, and for the you know discussion and conversation to emerge, I think this could happen. Yes, I think this this is what is happening in this kind of a way of working. And um, I don't know to what extent it becomes also like a uh, yeah just you know another kind of a. Um, uh, object that circulates in uh, uh, exhibitions or in festivals, and that's it. Um, but I wouldn't undermine the, um, yeah, like the, the, the political, uh, let's say, um, um, yeah, like the political power, or like the, yeah, I wouldn't undermine it of the medium itself. Um, I think it, what it gives, if it gives time, it's, it gives another temporality to, to things, it gives another temporality to, uh, to the kind of activism that you find on a platform or like on social media or it's another, it's demanding a time, demanding another temporality to be able to reflect, think about and not only share, react and then forget. So it, it imposes a certain, uh, yeah, it demands a time, temporality, and I think that's maybe the interesting thing about it. Um, after our discussions, I should be very careful as a Turkish woman saying something wrong about the Kurdish women uh, movement, but I'm asking this question in a like in a general uh, sense. I, uh, I try to understand your points about intersection of the colonial struggles with ecology, but uh, I have some concerns because of rising militarism and uh, its effects on environmental crisis. And uh, I want to ask you, um, how, how far should we support our struggle what do you think about this phrase of non-violent protests? What is self-defense, for example? And um, yeah, uh, like um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think it's a very important question because also like a uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a very complicated question. It's, I don't think there is like a, a kind of a right or, or wrong position in that. Um, of course, like a, a state militarism is something, and state-imposed violence is, is something, and a, a police violence is, you know, one thing. And uh, on the other hand, if you want to think about emancipatory violence, that is maybe like an old-fashioned uh, kind of, uh, yeah, concept or uh, we, I mean, maybe we can think of like a self-defense and maybe that's not uh, old-fashioned in, in the feminist sense. Um, and what we were saying earlier, you know, that so many uh, women that are committing crimes or, um, you know, even like finding themselves in prison um, are reacting to a yeah, certain uh, violence or like, you know, killing the husband or the father or the brother, I don't know, like the um, perpetrator. So um, I think that in, in that sense, a, if, you, if you want to think about self-defense with 
a situation of femicide that the world live in, um, it's quite, um, it, it becomes, you know, um, the question of non-violence becomes um, absurd, you know, exactly. Um, if you want to think about self-defense from a anti-colonial struggle, right, also the question of non-violence becomes absurd. So it really depends from where you are thinking about it. Um, and imagine, can you imagine at all like a uh, anti-colonial uh, struggle or like a, yeah, I don't know, uh, the, Algerian, uh, the Algerian resistance without any kind of a weapon or without any kind of violence? Uh, I think it's, it's difficult. So yeah, so this would be my answer. Yeah, can I ask a question? Um, yeah, and uh, one film we are showing upstairs um, um, is about Jamila Bouhaili, uh, and but you uh, raised the question, uh, the, the, the ambiguous um, per, per, uh, how is it, character of her, uh, her actions. So can you um, explain your um, uh, opinions on Jamila, or who she, yeah, who she was. Yeah, I mean, for, uh, what I was trying to do is actually really like, uh, you know, think about that question of violence and, the, you know, like uh, bring up this uh, discussion on uh, emancipatory violence or violence as an emancipatory, or how a violence is, can become an em em emancipatory. Uh, in the case of uh, anti-colonial struggle, and so yeah, so I think I, this is why I was, you know, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, maybe we should explain what she does. So she was, uh, when uh, Algeria was um, uh, occupied by the French, she was uh, placing handmade, homemade bombs uh, in uh, caf at cafes, to, uh, yeah, yeah, it, I don't have to <laughs> explain what to. Uh, and uh, she was then arrested and tortured by the French and uh, she had a famous um, lawyer who saved her and she still lives, she's over 80, I guess. So, but uh, Françoise Vergis says she was never taken into feminist canon because of her violent actions, because there is this tendency to pacify feminist struggle as if it was a passive, um, how do you say, protest, like sitting at a protest, but many feminist um, famous figures were actually quite violent, but the stories are uh, told differently or institutionalized. So, um, yeah, what was the question? Yeah, I just wanted to explain yeah. who Jamila was. And yeah, then, thank you. Yeah, okay, maybe this is the other half of that question, so to say. Like many of your films show women taking the matter into their own hands, so to say. And uh, I wonder if there isn't an, of course, unintended uh, or maybe calculated risk of, in a way, naturalizing the unfortunately still spread phenomenon that it's always the women in the end who take the care work. Mm, yeah. Yeah, because most of the uh, most of uh, most of the communes and cooperatives are actually yeah women caring, maintaining, and doing this reproductive work. And uh, yeah, this is a this is a very good uh, critique actually as well. When we are thinking about you know or praising the care work or like this reproductive work, um, we're actually we're actually I mean the risk is to um, you know kind of a, yeah, romanticize it and almost. Um, fixate the division or like this uh, 
labor division or like this uh, gendered division of labor. Um, but at the same time, I think what we try to do is more like a um, open up the structures that allow for, you know, like the world to be, right? I mean, <clears throat> without all this work or without all this kind of a, um, whether like a resistant work, but also without like a kind of a, uh, this whole, um, yeah, maintenance work, um, the other kind of work that, you know, um, is more like obviously seen as work wouldn't exist. So I guess like, um, yeah, I don't know if it's about romanticizing, fetishizing and fixating this type of work to women or naturalizing it, let's say, naturalizing it. Uh, but more about trying to um, give it its value or, you know, look at its value or like understand its, its value in relation to productive work. It's always a kind of a value in relation to productive work. So, yeah, I think it's more this type of, uh, or like this kind of gesture. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, bonus question I didn't mention, <laughs> but I I want to ask uh, why did you uh, decide to go back to Ottoman history of Lebanon to uh, by writing this uh, yeah. chart for the leadership and why do you think it's there are still interesting yeah. uh, forms of uh, regulation in the Ottoman past yeah. to, to reactivate it in, yeah. in our present. Yeah. yeah, I think that this question of the usership uh, of land is important. But I mean, there was, there is still in the, um, you know, like a lot of land code in Lebanon are still built uh, after the Ottoman land code. So, uh, and certain categories of uh, commons and or like land that does not, uh, that is beyond private and public, so it's common. Um, so these categories still exist. It's a status, it's a legal status, yeah. Um, and I think that um, it was almost like a yeah, way to um, try to reactivate these existing categories and trying to bring forward that uh, relationship to, to land that is one of usership rather than one of ownership, right? So it's almost like an uh, impossible project if you think about it from today, from like where we stand today. But at the same time, I think that it's a, yeah, already like what it does, it, it, op it opens the, a new perception to land. So you start to perceive it differently. You start to perceive the, and I guess this is what the work does. You start to perceive the possibility of land or like the possibility of a different relationship to land that is not one of ownership. And you start to perceive the landscape differently as well that is not one that is owned, but one that is used for, you know, a kind of a uh, survival and, you know. The locals. Yeah. yeah not uh, yeah. Local no, local. yeah, exactly, yeah. of course. So yeah, so I think that this is a, I, I guess like most of the work, this is what it is uh, doing. Uh, it's trying to change a, a, the perception or flip, flip the perception from one that is, you know, built around ownership to one that is built around usership. Yeah. In the, you know, I don't know where that leads to, but this, it reminds me of that old good squatter slogan. Yeah. Uh, die Häuser, die Häuser denen, die drin wohnen. Yeah. Like, literally, like the, the houses to those, or should belong to those who yeah. live within. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah
exactly. we, we lose them, right? Yeah, exactly. So this yes. is a general idea of like a, against property in yeah. a way, right? And yeah. pro usage. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly where it's coming from. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Marva. Thank you Marva so much. Azanias. Thank you very much, Nikhil Shumgan. Thank you very much, the great audience, and the enriching uh, questions and comments. And uh, yeah, this was Marva Azanios on the occasion of her exhibition Matter of Alliances at the Heidelberger Kunstverein, still running through April 30, 2023. Ah, so it's